Zach, we are back and we are talking dynasty breakouts to buy while you still can before their prices go up in this upcoming season. We hope you guys enjoy the video. Please leave a like if you do. Comment down below who are some of your favorite breakouts. And if you want to chat up with us that much more, head on over to patreon.com. Get in that Discord server for a free seven day trial and see what we can do for your dynasty teams. Now, with each of these breakouts, they can be kind of different levels. You know, not every breakout is created equal. Some breakout as a wide receiver running back one. We're going to differentiate that for you all as best as we can where we think these players are going to end up. But, Zach, with all that said, all the promo in the books, let's get to the content the people came for. You got a channel favorite coming up here um, in Demario Douglas. Why don't you tell me about him? He finished as the wide receiver 64 in the 2023 season, Bob. Now, to me, that's something important to keep in mind when we're talking about players that I expect to break out. For me, this is like player that I expect to outperform this either finish or ADP, et cetera, et cetera. And by a good margin, right? Not wide receiver 57. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a significant jump in either the performance from last year or the current ADP. And I, I feel very safe in expecting those things from Demario Douglas. Look, the offense and the quarterback play last year for New England was it has nowhere nowhere else to go but up. It gets an improvement in Drake May or Jacoby Brissett at the helm. Then we look at the skill position players. Who did they add? Who did they take away? Well, Kendrick Bourne is still there, but he's going to be hobbling around, uh, recovering from an ACL. And I do expect Kendrick Bourne to be a thing. I actually think Kendrick Bourne, when healthy, is one of the two starting outside wide receivers for that team. And then they brought in two rookie wide receivers in Jalen Polk and Javon Baker, two rookies that I actually really like. I, I kind of really like this wide receiver room low key, not to do anything crazy, but just to be like solid, a solid wide receiver room from top to bottom. The slot is really where Demario Douglas uh, fits in on this team. And there's really nobody, you know, they, they might play some of these other wide receivers at the slot for a few snaps or, you know, a percentage of, of the, of the snaps out of the slot. But I expect, Mario Douglas to be the head honcho when it comes to being the slot wide receiver. And he has a stranglehold at, at, at the snaps at that position from week seven on last year, Bob, Demario Douglas had a 21% target share and 25% air yard share for new England. He was still very much involved and progressed into this offense as a sixth round rookie last year. And of course you look at what was the difference from week seven on Kendrick Bourne was out. They had a couple of other injuries at the skill position players and Demario Douglas really stepped in and was a part of that offense. And just to take this a little bit further, like paying attention to Demario Douglas in training camp last year really is paying off right now because I expect him to be, you know, a top 50 wide receiver at the, at the minimum. But I, you know, I think he could be a, a top 36 wide receiver when all is said and done this season. And if you were paying attention to training camp reports last year, you were able to get him for free and just stash him on your taxi spot. Nobody drafted Demario Douglas last year, unless you had a six round rookie draft, regardless, how am I going to buy Demario Douglas? Well, I looked on dynasty daddy, for some recent trades. So these are all trades within the last 10 days for Demario Douglas. And they all, they, they felt like trades I would immediately pull um, to, to get this move done. The first trade was just straight up a 25 second round pick for Demario Douglas. I would do that. I do like the 25 class right now at, at the wide receiver position. As a matter of fact, you and I, Bob are in a C2C draft right now. So we're getting very familiar with the senior and junior wide receivers that are coming out next year. However, you know, I'm making this move. If I, if I, need to fill a position and need some points or need some depth and expecting my team to be good. So I'm expecting this to be a ladder uh, second round pick. Another trade that was just shocking to me in a full PPR league, somebody just traded straight up Audric Estime for Demario Douglas, which was just dumbfounding. And that's, that's the, the beat writer reports of the uh, funeral of Javante Williams coming to fruition by trading Demario Douglas for Audric Estime straight up. One that really made me cry deep down inside was Kendra Miller for Demario Douglas. I'm not giving up on Kendra Miller. I'm like Jack on the boat or off the boat in Titanic in the water. I'm holding on to the to the door handle and I'm freezing my tush off, but I'm not going to let go. And then last but not least, one that kind of worked in the, if you kind of reverse uh, the, the values we've been talking about, somebody traded Debo Samuel for Demario Douglas and a 25 first. I really like that pivot off of Debo Samuel. Um, tearing down at the wide receiver position, getting some production, and also getting a first-round pick, Bob. Yeah, I don't hate some of these. I think, you know, sending a 25 seconds straight up for Douglas is probably a little rich for me. 
Um, depending on what I think you can get out of them, I think you know top fifty sure definitely within the cards. I think just off of the volume I expect them to get, but. If he's not hitting wide receiver three numbers, I'm not going to feel good about that 25 second for Douglas. If I got a third back, um, something along those lines, even if it was the following year, anything to add onto that value, I'd be okay with it. Audric Estime for a Douglas, absolutely. Kendra Miller hurts me as much as it hurts you. Um, and then the Debo deal, you know, if, if you're thinking that that's an adjacent first from the team that's picking up Debo Samuel, so it's not the team picking up what is expected to be a competitive asset in Debo Samuel. And that first is on the front half of the first round. I feel okay about that deal because you're making a move that's basically putting you in more of a rebuilding or retooling scenario where you're getting a younger wideout. You're getting this mid to early first round pick. I can live with that, but I do have some concerns just with this offense. If it's going to be Brissett, if it's going to be Drake May, you know, still I think Brissett is probably a decent enough upgrade over what they had last year. But I'd ultimately prefer prefer to get May in there. But with these rookie quarterbacks. You know, this team is not ready to push to compete anyway. They're not going to be pushing for a playoff spot, so they may as well, you know, do what's best for May, sit him if they need to, let him get work, get reps, and get ready for taking over that starting role next year, possibly. But yeah, I don't know. I don't hate Douglas by any stretch of the imagination and definitely could break out into a top 50 role for sure. And, you know, based on his value now, yeah, probably buying a little low on that for sure. I will get into my first breakup candidate, and I've been talking about this guy for a little bit now. Told you to stop sleeping on him last week, and I still think you need to stop sleeping on my one of my favorite breakout candidates at Safe Lars. I think he's coming in for a top 15 season, Zach. I originally had him on the sheet as a top 20 pick, but I just finished my 2024 projections version 2.0, and Zay Flowers is actually coming in hot at wide receiver 14 in those projections. So I had to put him in top 15. Top 20 felt too easy. So I put him there, previous finishes, wide receiver 31 in 2023 as a rookie. But why is he breaking out? We can't forget about this 24% target share he had in 2023 as a rookie. Joining elite company, other first round rookie wide receivers with 24% or more target share the rookie season. Odell Beckham, Drake London, Chris Olave, Kelvin Benjamin. Not as exciting, obviously, but Justin Jefferson, Mike Evans, Jalen Waddle, Garrett Wilson, Sammy Watkins, Jamar Chase and Zay Flowers, end list. One of those guys is still valued as a low-end wide receiver, too, and that's Zay Flowers. Because of the offense he's in and the offensive situation he's perceived to be in with the Ravens, not being a passing offense, not being the number one, the true number one target on his offense, but he's the number one wide receiver target in this offense, and he's the wide receiver one, or the receiver, 1A, 1B, alongside Mark Andrews, if you ask me. And I don't think there's a huge split there. I think they're pretty neck and neck because the rest of this receiver room and even the running back room, they are not going to be taking a lot of targets away from this uh, this duo of Mark Andrews and Zay Flowers. So looking at some recent trades on Dynasty Daddy, value suggests that I could move Xavier Worthy plus a third for Zay Flowers, Jordan Addison straight up for Zay Flowers, David Montgomery for Zay Flowers, Cole Komet for Zay Flowers and a 0.5 tight end premium, or Straight up, keep it simple, 25 first for Zay Flowers. I'd make all of these deals in a heartbeat. As much as I do like Xavier Worthy, it's just a matter of if I'm a competitive team and I'm looking for a breakout candidate, I think Zay Flowers is much more that than a rookie going into what could be the third receiver option in his or the fourth receiver option even in his offense behind Kelsey, Rashi Rice, and Marquise Brown. Jordan Addison, I've Laid out my beef for him this offseason already plenty, so that's an easy move for me. Dave Montgomery, while a good running back and a serviceable one, one that is less exciting to me. He's a good running back too, but Zay Flowers, somebody who could be right up there with wide receiver one, wide receiver two, high-end wide receiver two numbers. I want that all day. Cole Komet, somebody in my projections who is absolutely buried on that depth chart now or that receiving pecking order. Not good news for him. Even at a 0.5 tight end premium, I still take Zay Flowers easily in this deal. Add on a third to Cole Komet if I had to. And then a 2025 first for Zay Flowers, I think that's pretty pretty spot on fair value for Zay Flowers. So that's where I'm at on Zay Flowers. And you'll hear me touch on my projections a few more times in today's video. If you want to get those projections, those are dropping August 1st, patreon.com forward slash Dynasty Rewind. In the gold tier, you will get a beautiful little spreadsheet with over 300 players projected. So... It's pretty cool stuff. But Zach, are you buying or selling this breakout? Are you buying these costs? What do you think about Zay Flowers? 
So a couple things. Uh, with these trades, I would definitely make most of these trades. I'm in agreement with sure. you on Xavier Worthy. I'm in agreement with you on Jordan Addison. I like the Montgomery trade. I think for a smart owner, it would take more for the Cole Komet sure. trade to get done, but I'd still try to do that. Good Lord, have I been moving off Cole Komet everywhere I possibly can. And then I have no issues with the 25 first for Zay Flowers. The only thing I'll say is I can't get on board with a top 15 finish. Um, and it could be close, but, uh, you know, when I look at the pecking order in that offense in total, I got Zay Flowers fourth. Um, in, 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 in just the pecking in order. Fantasy of, uh, output? Yeah, yeah, because okay. I'm going to – not not the wide receivers or the scope. I've got gotcha. Mark Andrews above Zay Flowers as long as he's healthy. Derrick Henry above Zay Flowers. I've got Lamar Jackson ahead of Zay Flowers. Like Obviously. there are going to be opportunities that Lamar Jackson is going to take away from Zay Flowers. Not a high percentage, but it, it still exists whenever you have a quarterback that makes plays with their feet. And then I got Zay Flowers. So, you know, do I think Zay Flowers can have a top 15 offense or a top 15 season? I should say, despite all that, I don't necessarily feel that. However, I don't think that the the points that you brought up are wrong. Like I'm kind of in the gray area on this one. I'm kind of on the fence on on this one because I felt this way about Zay Flowers for a while and you bring good points to the table. And so I just I I don't like to invest myself currently. However, the trades that you presented, I like all the Zay Flower sides on those trades. Sure. So if that's what it takes me to get Zay Flowers, I'm on board. Like I'm, I'm with it, and I don't think any of those are like crazy. Like no way that get done. Like they're all pretty fair, except for the Cole Komet. I think the, a smart owner it would take more because I, I know what I'm getting at Cole Komet. I'd be like, come on, bro. Like you know, give me a little bit more for that. Um, but like I said, I just I don't know if I'm on board with a top 15 finish. But I, okay. I can appreciate the evidence that you brought to the table. I'm just not there is all. I, I get that. I can respect that. And I have no issue with that. You know, agreeing on the being happy with what you do expect coming with that value. And then, hey, maybe you get this return on top that you didn't even know you were getting. You're buying that much lower than you thought you were. I like I said, I agree with you on these values. I wouldn't be surprised if you had to throw a little bit more on top of some of these guys. But yeah. for the most part, I think it's pretty. Well, one thing I will say, Bob, is I do expect him to finish better than wide receiver 31. Which again, oh, easy. Yeah. It, it, the genesis of this is yes, I, I get it. We're looking for a breakout. I'm always looking for who can either outperform their finish or their ADP from last year. And I, there's no question to me that Zay Flowers checks both of those boxes. So I'll, I'll just put that out there. Do I think he's top 15? No. But do I think he's better than what he was last year and better than his ADP? Yes. Go ahead. Talk about this quarterback here. This is definitely a point of contention after a tough rookie season. Zach, who do you got here? It's Bryce Young. <laughs> It's Bryce Young, and I think that Bryce Young can be a top 15 quarterback. I wanted to say top 18, and then I looked at his finish last year, and it was quarterback 23, and I was like, oh, top 18 is not much of an improvement. But then you you have to figure that last year there was like six quarterbacks that were out for the season with season-ending injuries. So in reality, Bryce Young was like quarterback 30 if those quarterbacks are healthy. So, you know, I like I, I couldn't say top 18 because – Again, he finished top 20. He was quarterback 23 last year. So top 18 is not that much of an improvement. But if, you know, we don't have a record-breaking number of injuries at the quarterback position, then quarterback 18 is not that bad. So, um, I, 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 you know, we have to be bold on these videos sometimes. So top 15 finish, and here's why. A lot of this doesn't necessarily have to do with Bryce Young as much as it has to do with what's around him. You can deny that Bryce Young will break out this year. But you can't deny that Dave Canales is the perfect catalyst to get his career back on track, Bob. As the Seahawks quarterback coach, he took over in 2018. And in that season for the Seahawks, uh, Russell Wilson improved on his completion percentage, his yards per attempt, his touchdown rate, his interception rate over his previous two seasons. Over his previous two seasons, he had a career best mark in passer rating that season. So we're talking about the prime of Russell Wilson's career and now Dave Canales comes in in his first year. Russell's doing better than he's done in, in three years at that point. We we fast forward to 2022 as Geno's quarterback coach in 2022. Geno Smith has a career re renaissance. But Geno Smith came in and 
he was a pro, a first time Pro Bowler that year. He won Comeback Player of the Year, and he was top ten in MVP voting. All this under Dave Canales' tutelage. Then Canales moves over to Tampa Bay. He's now the offensive coordinator, and he he works with Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield threw for over four thousand yards and twenty eight touchdowns to just ten interceptions under Canales. And in the previous two seasons. Uh, Mayfield had thrown 27 touchdowns to 21 interceptions, so almost a one-to-one interception to touchdown ratio, as opposed to a three-to-one touchdown interception ratio. And and in those two seasons without Canales, Baker Mayfield barely completed 60 percent of his passes. So, you know, the, the the touchdowns improved, the efficiency improved, the interceptions decreased. Everything was better by a large margin for Baker Mayfield. So we're looking at several examples of Canales coming in and working with quarterbacks, even established quarterbacks, Bob, and just giving them new life um, in terms of, you know, being being an MVP candidate, being a pro bowler. Being, Baker Mayfield just got a, a $100 million contract thanks to Dave Canales. Do I think Dave Canales can do something with the talent that Bryce Young has when he's been able to do it with Russell Wilson, Baker Mayfield, and then Geno Smith? Yes, I do. I do. And I like it again, it's not very hard to go up from what there was last year. You look at that offense last year, it was kind of a joke. The wide receivers couldn't get open. They addressed that. We've talked about like if we love Deontay Johnson, then we can't be so low on Bryce Young because they kind of go mm-hmm. hand in hand. For me, this is a player that if I can get at the right price, I'm not trying to overpay for a Bryce Young. Like I, I had to say to myself, would I feel comfortable dealing a first round pick for Bryce Young? And the answer to that was no. I'm hopeful that he will get better, but there was a there was a lot of bad last year. That's hard to just give all this information that I gave and say none of that matters last year because it does. And you know, we've seen quarterbacks get ruined by a lack of confidence. The Dolphins barely saved two Otunga by Loa, but look at Justin Fields right now. Look what the Chicago Bears did to Justin Fields. It's not that Justin Fields is bad, it's that Chicago never surrounded him and and played to what his strengths are. Um, and so I think that Canales can come in to Carolina and do that with Bryce Young. So here are some recent trades on Dynasty Daddy that I felt comfortable with. Uh, Bryce Young for Zamir White in 25 second. I'm not on the Zamir White hype train. Maybe he has a good season. Is he a long-term Dynasty asset? Absolutely not. And then this trade, this is a trade here, Bob, that I, I wouldn't want to do. But I would do. And that's kind of where a trade should be, right? It's like, ah, I don't want to give up this first-round pick. Sure. But I, I kind of have to. I have to to get this deal done. So it was Bryce Young and a 25 second for a 25 first. That's the kind of deal that sometimes – like, I feel like a trade should – both sides should be like, yay, and also like, dang, I had to give that up. And I think <laughs> that's exactly what that trade is right there. I don't disagree with this pick one bit, and I'm glad you mentioned the adding of the weapons in Deontay Johnson, Jatavion Sanders, Xavier Leggett, and Jonathan Brooks as well. While we might not get to see full Jonathan Brooks this year with the ACL, either way, they're investing in Bryce Young. They're investing around Bryce Young, getting him a better coach that has, as you alluded to, has a great track record of making quarterbacks better, not worse. And all of these things, while, yes, I hope, Man, I I don't know if I could stomach a top 15. Top 20 feels good to me. Um, maybe in two years or another year, we're talking about top 15 if we see a nice jump this year, um, especially as all those weapons around him you know, have another year to soak in the league and get it comfortable with each other, that being Deontay Johnson, and then all of the youthful options they added to see like a full breakout from Bryce Young. Either way, I think we definitely see an improvement on last year. I know, like you said, it's not super hard to improve on you know, the poor quarterback finish he had last year. But I definitely think better things are coming for Bryce Young. And I think the thing is, is if you're going to get in now, you're kind of getting in cheaper than you'll be because that'll, that'll be the mindset. If he if he takes a step up this year, it's going to be that much harder to get him next offseason. So if you're getting in now, you might have to be thinking kind of two years ahead. And if you're thinking, hey, I need a quarterback anyway, you look ahead at next year's quarterback draft. Not great. It, it's not looking awesome for the quarterback position in next year's rookie draft at this point. A lot of question marks across the board. It's not going to be a fun quarterback draft. So maybe this is how you kind of think of, hey, this is my quarterback pick for next year's rookie draft instead of, you know, what I'm going to have to suffer through and get in the draft next year. So you're kind of hopefully you're still a more competitive team that picks a little later than early. But I don't hate the deal. And Zamir White might be one of my most overrated running backs um, in my projections for whatever that's worth to anybody. You'll have to find out in the uh, gold tier. 
But either which way, we will move right along and we will talk about one of our favorite wide receivers. He was mine first, but you hopped on the bandwagon early enough for me to allow the calling of him ours. But either which way, I'm talking about Chris Olave here. Wide receiver 16 finishes in 2023 and wide receiver 25 finish in 2022. Excuse my verbiage there. But either which way, why is the breakout coming, Zach? We see an upgrade offensive coordinator, a much needed one for this offense. Clint Kubiak coming to town year two with Derek Carr while still mid a mid quarterback that is uh, can support wide receivers one wide receiver ones. We've seen it with Devontae Adams. We've seen it with Amari Cooper. I don't know if, you know, Chris Olave is probably somewhere in the middle of those two, but or maybe even below. If you want to argue that, that's fine by me. But no more Michael Thomas in town, who I know hasn't really been much for consistent competition. But this wide receiver room is full of questions. Otherwise, as much as I like a guy like Rashid Jaheed and A.T. Perry and Cedric Wilson, you know, there, there's questions. And Bub Means, can't forget about Bub Means. And no strong tight end option either, unless you count Taysom Hill. Juwan Johnson is there, but Taysom Hill just doesn't get a consistent enough target share as a tight end. He's more using these other gadgety options, and I think that probably probably comes to a halt with Clint Kubiak coming to town. Juwan Johnson might get more of a traditional tight end role as well and get more target share. Who knows? But there's no dominant other option other than Alvin Kamara out of the backfield. So it's really going to be the Alvin Kamara, Chris Olave, and you know Derek Carr-ish show where... I don't see a lot of other fantasy fruitful options coming out of this backfield at least or out of this offense this season. So looking at recent trades on Dynasty Daddy, Jordan Addison plus 25 first for Chris Olave, Romo Dunze straight up for Chris Olave, Kyron Williams plus Stefan Diggs for Chris Olave, and Brandon Ayuk plus a second round pick for Chris Olave. These are all very interesting to me. I think Jordan Addison is one that, you know, we've seen a bit of a dip in his value with the DUI stuff coming out. And maybe people tuning in to be saying, hey, he's overvalued as a top end or a low end wide receiver, too. I don't know if that's the case. It's probably more the DUI than me. But either which way, you know, I think that's a tough one. I think there's people on both sides of the fence on that one for sure. I definitely want the Chris Olave side. Roma Dunze for Chris Olave every day of the week. One thing we need to stop doing as dynasty managers is hyping up these rookies their first seasons when there is clear veteran target competition for them. Like there is for Romo Dunze, like there was for Jackson Smith and Jigba last year, who also has the same offensive coordinator that Jackson Smith and Jigba had last year. Uh, Kyron Williams for Stefan Diggs, I think is probably closer than people think. That one kind of has like a reverse sticker shock. You kind of got to look at it more. Um, Kyron Williams, I know is a guy that you and I both like a good bit and believe will produce very well as a running back this year. Stefan Diggs, I think, is somebody that people are a little lower on than they probably should be. As much as he's like a quote-unquote unexciting, aging veteran wide receiver, he's still going to be targeted heavily in this Houston offense. And if you like C.J. Stroud, you got to like Stefan Diggs too. As much as he's been super frustrating down the stretch for managers the last couple of years, but moving that for Stefan Diggs, you get a lot of longevity out of this one, in my opinion. You lose some pop for this year if you're a, a competitive team you definitely lose some pop going to Chris Olave but I still like him as a top 15 option this year um, and then the last one Brandon Ayuk for a second and a second excuse me for Chris Olave I think that one's probably pretty darn close that one makes me hesitate a little bit solely because of what's going on with all the Brandon Ayuk stuff if he gets traded and he's the one somewhere and like a bona fide wide receiver one somewhere I swing very heavily with Brandon Ayuk because if he doesn't have the tar same target competition like if you switch Chris Olave and Brandon Ayuk situations I'd want Brandon Ayuk but you know, it, it, and in this deal, those are some options, Zach. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know you like Chris Olave as well. Feel free to add on anything and talk some of these trades that have happened in the last week. Yeah, that's the thing to remember, too. When we are talking about these trades, they're actually trades that happened and they're mm -hmm. typically within a close time frame to when we're recording this video. It's not like, oh, this trade happened six weeks six ago. No. ago. No, this happened like six days ago. <laughs> so, listen, I'm. Man, I love Chris Olave. I love having Chris Olave. I love drafting Chris Olave. I love trading for Chris Olave. I hope you're right because I certainly <laughs> do have quite a bit of Chris Olave. Um, these trades, I got no problems for these trades. The brand that you one's tough for every reason that you mentioned. He's a product of efficiency in San Francisco as opposed to volume, and you would expect that to change if he were traded somewhere. Um, but you cannot be afraid to lose – a little bit of value when trading for what you think is going to be a staple of your fantasy roster for, for a long time to come. So sometimes it happens. Sometimes you lose a trade by a little bit. Sometimes you win a trade by a little bit. Like you, you can't be afraid of that. 
there are a lot of people, and this was myself um, in the beginning of Dynasty, where I was like, oh, this trade calculator says it's even. Like, eh, okay, so what? You know, it's, it's not, that's, that's not everything. It's not the end-all, be-all. It's, it's, it's not AI. It's just, it's an algorithm. Like, let's calm down here. But I, I, I love Chris Olave on this list. Um, I hope that he certainly does. Um, I mean, look, again, everything is there for him. There's not a whole lot of competition in the wide receiver room. I do think Rashid Shahid does have a decent season. Um, as the wide receiver too, there might be one of these, you know, there, there's some other rookie they're talking about in like 32 beat writers keeps retweeting Mason Tipton, I think is the wide receiver they're talking about today. There's some rookie wide receiver that probably going to do something on this team. Um, I haven't heard much about AT Perry. So again, like the fact that I'm saying that is good. The fact that I'm saying <laughs> sure. those things is good for Chris Olave. I mean, I'm just in total agreement with you. I don't have too much else to add or disagree with. Like, man, having Chris Olave on my roster is, is something I'd be trying to do every – like, if I take over an orphan, do I have Chris Olave? No. Who's got him? You know, that, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's my my process there. So I love, I love this, and I hope you're right, Bob. Chris Olave, wide receiver nine in my 2024 projections. So Let's go, David Carr. Or Derek Carr, Derek. whatever one, whatever one, cars. <laughs> and we're doing something we don't normally do here. I doubled up here because I knew with what Zach had to bring to the table with the, <laughs> what is now the final segment. Oh, no. I was just not going to be able to handle it. I would need a break. <laughs> so I am doubling down here or doubling up, I should say, going back to back to wrap it out, finish it out, whatever the case is, my last breakout candidate. And I know this player has been a point of contention for this channel for a long time, but we're putting some respect on the name now. Drake London. I am known as a top 15, but spoiler alert, in my projections, he's wide receiver 10. So he's actually a top 10 breakout candidate. Previous fantasy football finishes, wide receiver 37 in 2023, wide receiver 31 in 2022. And the reasons being the stars have finally aligned. Everything that we had wrong with Drake London outside of his value, you know, the quarterback situation, the offensive coordinator, offensive coordinator situation, all the stars have aligned, not one, but two new quarterbacks, although only one gets to play at a time, unless you're running some wonky offenses, I guess. But you have a new offensive coordinator from a proven coaching tree. Still not a ton of competition for targets outside of Kyle Pitts and Bijan Robinson, even with the additions of Darnell Mooney and Rondale Moore. I don't expect them to make a big impact. So Drake London should finally make good on what his price tag has been for a long time. If you've managed to hold on to him, good job. If you've bought him low even better job looking at buying as always the price tag has always been the issue and with a proper quarterback addition shocker shocker he hasn't gotten any cheaper but looking at some recent trades we have another brandon Ayuk deal moving brandon Ayuk and a second round pick for drake london also doubling that up brandon Ayuk plus a fourth for drake london which i'll admit i obviously feel a lot better about uh dalton kincaid for drake london straight up in a 0.5 tight end premium and then zach previewing the next segment a little bit possibly Jahan dotson plus a 25 first for drake london this is tough i mean i'm probably pretty okay with all these deals if i saw him go down to my league i wouldn't you know clown anybody in the comments or anything like that brandon you can a second feels rich because i do have brandon you can drake london pretty close um in all honesty brandon you is a top 15 for me i believe so you know moving a second round pick in addition to get to Drake London while in arguably better situation because he doesn't have all the competition around it for targets like Ayuk does just feels a little rich to make a you know maybe a point per game increase probably less than that though probably closer to like a half point per game increase um, based on what I have in my projections but otherwise Don Kincaid as much as I love Don Kincaid if he didn't happen to be my tight end one for whatever reason I don't hate that value. I'd probably still prefer Dalton Kincaid in a vacuum if I didn't have, like if somebody came to me offering Drake Leonard for Dalton Kincaid and I don't have a tight end, I'd probably just say, hey, good offer, but I'm just going to stay put. But I can't fault anybody for making that deal. I would definitely move Jahan Dotson plus 25 first for Drake London, though. Zach, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Drake London. If you have any, Zach, on these costs, any additional costs you'd like to throw in here? Well, I'm just going to come out and say I'm not doing the Dalton Kincaid trade. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. I'd probably say put two. First of all, thank you for giving a realistic breakout. Um, top 15, I can get with that. Uh, I cannot get with some of the prices that were there like the week or two after Kirk Cousins signed um, sure. with the Falcons. I, I, I just couldn't get behind it, and I think the community – overcorrected drake london is such a pen pendulum with the community like 
At first, it was everybody's overvaluing, and that's where we stood as a channel. Then it was people were undervaluing him, and I think that got to be more appropriate. And now we swung back the other way, and we have overvalued Drake London as a community. Um, I'm somebody. I'm a big. Uh, you got. I got to see it before I believe it. Kind of a person, and I get that part of what we do here is projecting. I just can't project a crit like a top five finish. Top yeah. ten, I can, I can get behind. I'm I'm not I'm I mean, not necessarily there, but I can get behind. Like I I, I can understand why why we're there. Um, I think that there are just so many other options in Atlanta. Um, you know, you mentioned them, uh, Kyle Pitts. Darnell Mooney. I know Ronda Moore's there. I don't really care about him. And the two running backs, B. John Robinson, and maybe a little bit of Tyler Algier as well. Um, and and just, just for that, I think they take away just a little bit from Drake London for him being top 10. I could be wrong. Top 15, I can get behind. I I yeah. I don't disagree with that whatsoever. And that's why I'm like, oh, thank God, a realistic projection for Drake London. Thank God. When I saw the show sheet, I'm oh, don't don't give me a heart attack. Don't make me like freak <laughs> out in the replies and the show sheet. But the, the only thing I'll say is I, I wouldn't do the Dalton Kincaid trade, especially in a tight end premium league. Maybe if it wasn't a tight end premium league, I, straight up I might do that just because of the positional value. If it's sure. just one point per reception for, for tight ends, I'd probably do that. But the fact that it's 1.5, the volume that I'm expecting Kincaid to get in that offense, um, I which I, I still don't think we're going to see the ceiling of Dalton Kincaid. I think it's still another year or two away. As long as that offense, you know, listen, Dawson Knox is still there, man. People don't want to hear that. People yeah. don't want to hear that. Uh, Dawson Knox is still there, and they're going to run a lot of two tight ends. And I just don't know if you're going to get the volume that you want for Dalton Kincaid. Maybe not this year, maybe next year. But um, I'm not against buying Drake London. How dare you besmirch somebody we're going to talk about uh, next year in just a second. I got no problem with the Brandon Ayuk offer uh, trade there. Jahan Dotson and a first for Drake London. I mean, that's obvious. That's it to me. That's a very obvious deal that makes sense. But I am going to talk about Jahan Dotson here, Bob. What What would make you give up Drake uh, Dalton Kincaid? Excuse me for Drake London a point five ten premium. Is it a third round pick? Does um, it need to no, be a second? A second round pick. Yeah, need to add okay. a second round pick. Um, that to me squares it up again. I'm giving up one point five points per reception to a, in in a situation mm-hmm. where. The, the, that's a that's a premium value in a league where tight ends get 1.5 or or more. Like you know, I know that you pulled that from Dynasty Daddy, but there are leagues that we play in that have a 0.75 uh, or one a full point tight end premium. That just makes Dalton Kincaid that much more valuable because he gets more points per reception than Drake right. London. I, I need that second round pick on top. Uh, we will move on to the last segment here. A player that I called mid and somebody I considered suggesting getting off your roster in a video last week or earlier this week, actually, now that I mention it. But either which way, Zach, talk about your favorite wide receiver to ever walk the earth. <laughs> what do you got here? This is this is so unfair because I already know how this is going to go. I know the comment section, but I feel like if we just stop for a second and just take a breath that we can all come to an agreement on this, okay? My player that I'm going to talk about here is Jahan Dotson. Now, look. Breakout candidate is a bit of a stretch. It's a, it's a stretch with John Dotson. All I'm saying is I feel comfortable that if he is healthy, that he will be a top 30 wide receiver. Now, let me lay out why. He's finished wide receiver 56 and 51 the last two seasons. But let's look at how those two seasons have gone. 2022, he missed five games. But outside of that, uh, John Dotson had five weeks as a wide receiver, 25 or better, and tied for the most touchdown receptions among all rookie wide receivers with seven. Let me present you with two scenarios, Bob, and you tell me which is more likely. Jahan Dotson forgot how to play football or Sam Howell was a bust of proportionate of epic proportions. Which of those two do you think is a more likely scenario? I think Sam Howell was probably overhyped. Okay, so he was a bust of epic proportions. Yeah, it's a little, yeah, sure. All I want to say is, I told you all to sell Sam Howell. I told you, I told you, I told you, I told. You. At the height of the Sam Howell yeah, um, uh, fantasy I point, like I, I said it in season when he was scoring point. I said mm-hmm. this, this is not a sustainable. This, this because you look at his production. Anyways, despite having the second most targets of his career, Bob Terry McLaurin posted what would be his worst fantasy output of his career as he had his lowest yards per target, yards per catch, and fantasy points per game uh, last year of his career. And all those numbers were down 25%, just about, from 2022 to 2023 when he was playing with Taylor Heineke. You know, I can I can look at that situation and say, 
Well, Terry McLaurin didn't forget how to play football. I just think Sam Howell sucked in terms of being a fantasy-relevant quarterback for your wide receivers. So why can I do that for Terry McLaurin, but I can't do that for Jahan Dotson, who has the exact same scenario that Terry McLaurin did? Look, he's wide receiver two on a team that that is perceived to have an improvement at the quarterback position and the offensive coordinator spot as well. And like we're talking about significant upgrades. Like Jaden Daniels to Sam Howell is, at least on paper, a massive improvement. And then Eric Bieniemy to Cliff Kingsbury. Despite what you think about Kingsbury, he's a good offensive mind. He's probably one of the top top five offensive minds in the NFL at the at the coordinator position right now. That's a vast improvement from what Eric Bieniemy showed he could be last year. And then we go a little bit further. Curtis Samuel's not on this team. Curtis Samuel had a, a, the second most targets at the wide receiver position. And you might say, like, whoa, how could that happen? Curtis Samuel is like lighting it up right now for the Bills. Like he was the Bills' big acquisition at the wide receiver position outside of Keon Coleman. So like, do not besmirch Curtis Samuel just because you don't like him. But they replaced Curtis Samuel with Luke McCaffrey in the draft. So they didn't really bring anyone else in. They brought in a third round, a third round rookie wide receiver. I don't think he uh, produces to the level of production that Curtis Samuel did. So I got. Uh, Jahan Dotson as a wide receiver two on a team that's a better offense, has a better quarterback, has a better coordinator, should be a more coherent offense. Okay, here's some recent trades, and here's probably another part of the reason that Jahan Dotson is on this list. I love one on DynastyDaddy.com. I got somebody trading Russell Wilson for Jahan Dotson. Get me, get me off the Russell Wilson train. Okay, how much longer is that thing gonna gonna chug along the tracks for? A 2026 second round pick for Jahan Dotson, not even 2025. 2026, two years down the road, <laughs> two years down the road. You tell me you can't get one second round pick back if he has one boom week. And then Zach Moss for Jahan Dotson, which pff, have your hopium, people. Have your Zach Moss hopium as Chase Brown is taking RB1 snaps right now for the Cincinnati Bengals as we record this. So these are some trades that I saw on Dynasty Daddy. I know it's not the sexiest name, but I do think that he will be much better fantasy wise than he was last year. I, I will say... Two to three things. A, the cost isn't too bad. I definitely wouldn't give up a second for him. If I'm giving up a second, I want Jahan and a third. That's that's where I'm at. Zach Moss, I'm okay with giving up for Jahan Dotson because I'm with you. I'm pretty, you know, yeah, if he gets running back one reps, sure. But like you just noted, Chase Brown's the one getting the, the running back one reps right now, which I love to see. Russell Wilson for Jahan Dotson. I need some quarterback tax on that one. Um, I need to get something back. I need to pick flip, whether it's I send a fourth to get a third, something along those lines. I think their values are relatively close, but I just need something more on top of the player upgrade um, or the player swap, I should say. But I, I, I I'll, add real quick, the quarterback tax is a, is a real thing, and I love that point. It is. It is. That's why I threw it in there. That's why I talked about it, Zach. Additionally, I'll say, too, that it, you know, as much as I am down on Jahan Dotson, I can 1,000% admit that Every th- or a lot of things seems to be breaking right for him in this offense. Be it we have an up- we have a quarterback upgrade, we have an offensive coordinator upgrade, we have Curtis Samuel gone. Although I don't think Luke McCaffrey ends up being a nothing burger, I think he ends up being something for this offense. I don't know if it's year one. The other thing I you know I'm a big Ben Sinnott guy, big Ben Sinnott guy. I don't know if and, and Zach Ertz when he's healthy it is a tight end that is likely to take the second uh, order of targets at that point is somebody who's most likely to take targets. Austin Eckler is in the backfield. He's going to take targets as well. I'm still not super in, but I I see a better pathway than, that, than what's been there for Jahan Dotson, 100%. These costs aren't terrible. Um, with what you are kind of expecting the breakout to be to hit a, you know, top 30 is probably a little rich for me, but wide receiver three, probably still a little rich, but fine. But just somebody I'm not super excited to invest in. And you know, there's a big difference between me saying Dot- Jahan Dotson isn't good and just that I don't know if he's going to be great for fantasy. I just no longer care to invest in him at, the, at this point. And, and honestly, Zach, I think a lot more people are with you on Jahan Dotson than you think. I think there's a lot of people still out there banging the drum for Jahan Dotson, maybe because they have to, maybe because they have a lot of Jahan Dotson kicking around that they are just hoping for the best at this point. But either way, I think there's a good number of people still in on Jahan Dotson than aren't in on Jahan Dotson. But I am, I am one that is not on the train, but I'll say, hey, bully to you. Good luck. Okay, I just got one thing to ask. I just got one okay, thing to ask. All right, all right, all right. you you liked him year one. I know, like, but so why don't you like him change, now? Zach. 
Things well, I understand. Change. I understand that, but explain to me the change that happened when we saw the disaster that was Sam Howell. And, and so the thing is, is even year one and year two, his target share, target gettingness was not great. Um, and that's what I that's what I have an issue with because when I look at you know targets being earned and things of that sort, um, one of the things that I've started diving into in rookie production research is when players don't meet the average in target share specifically in their rookie season rookie average for a first round wide receiver is about 19 percent Jahan Dotson was like 15 percent or 16 percent I don't remember exactly which one it was when they don't hit that average that's not great and that so that that gives me some pause and then I'm trying to pull up a stat real quick here. So in in matters of just adjusting to new information we don't want to be we don't want to have take lock you get it but looking at the last 10 seasons and shouting out Jacob Gibbs on Twitter, we've shouted out this stat a little bit. Looking at players, wide receivers that meet these criteria, 24 years or younger, first round NFL draft capital, 350 plus routes run in a season, target per route run rate below 17%. You have Nelson Aguilar twice, Philip Dorsett, Jalen Rager, Laquan Treadwell, John Ross, Quentin Johnson, and then you have Jahan Dotson twice, each of his first two seasons. And that's just not great company. So when you see him mixed up in stats like that, I don't love that. And what propelled his first season was a very high touchdown rate. And that's, you know, things that, yeah, well, great. That'd be awesome. You know, touchdown rate is, as we know, as fantasy players and managers, that touchdown rate is kind of fluky. You can only expect it to stay consistent year to year so much. That's the touchdown regression every single year, positive and negative regression, all that stuff. I, I liked him as a prospect, but, you know, at the end of the day, once I see him get in the, get in the game and everything, I, I have to adjust and I am, you know, willing to be wrong on this because even if, even if he, you know, does hit this top 30 mark. I don't think he's ascending past top 30, you know, really anytime soon, you know, like getting up into top 24 or top 12 or anything like that. So if I invest now, am I really ever going to get much on top of my investment in terms of production or return on investment in terms of getting more picks back, whatever the case is? Um, or am I just going to get fair value, which isn't the worst thing, or I could just turn around and invest that, that capital elsewhere. So that's kind of my my two cents, three cents, whole dollar, if you will, on Jahan Dotson. With that said, this video is done. But while that is it for this video, we hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like, comment down below if you enjoyed it. Who are some of your favorite breakouts? And we want to hear from you over in the Discord as well. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash nice rewind. Get in that Discord server for a free seven day trial and see what we can do for your dynasty teams. But with all that said, all the promo in the book, Zach and I are going to get the heck out of here. We will see you in the next one. But until then, I hope that y'all have a good one.